Awesome. Hello, everyone. There has been much talk about the challenges Black people face while trying to break into the game industry. But there are several ways you can forge your own path from developing your own game to starting your own company or brand. While it's important to understand the challenges, let's not dwell on them too much. Instead, let's awesome. celebrate and understand Hello, how everyone. Black entrepreneurs, there has been streamers, much- developers. Sorry, I hear myself in the echo. I had to stop for a second. I'm like, oh my gosh. No, it's me. It's LinkedIn. Ignore that, everyone. Uh, so. Let's instead celebrate and understand how Black entrepreneurs, streamers, developers, and other creatives develop their own paths and learn the aha moments they experienced along the way. Have you ever wondered how someone entered this industry and stayed resilient? Do you ever think about how to start your own brand and flourish in it? And how do you make yourself stand out even when it feels hard to do? I'm Robin, and this is Open World Dialogue, and today we have three incredible guests who would tell us their stories of how they did it, and that in turn just might inspire you to take action in the gaming industry too. So first up, we have Tanya DePass. Tanya is the founder and director of I Need Diverse Games, Rivals of Waterdeep producer, and cast member on twitch.tv slash Rivals of Waterdeep, a partner Twitch variety strip variety broadcaster, excuse me, and RPG developer slash writer slash consultant. She's the creator and creative director for Into the Motherlands RPG, as well as a senior Annenberg Civics Media Fellow at USC. Additionally, she's part of the inaugural TGA Future Class of 2020. She was also named as one of the Gamers of the Year 2020 by Kotaku, along with three of her counterparts. She was also invited to the Xbox MVP program in February of 2021. Her work to make the industry more inclusive has been highlighted in Game Changer, directed by Tina Charles, WNBA star and Olympian, as well as filmmaker. The short documentary premiered at Tribeca 2021 as part of the Queen Collective, an initiative started by Queen Latifah, supported by Procter & Gamble, and an effort to get more Black women into filmmaking. Game Changer was also featured as part of BET Her's 2021 Juneteenth programming on June 19, 2021. Most recently, she was named the Gaming Awards icon for 2022. Next up, we have Keisha Howard. Keisha is best known as the creator of Sugar Gamers, the world's longest running gaming and tech community geared towards inclusivity. What began as a multicultural gamer group is now an award-winning organization that supports its inclusive membership and finding their place in the rapidly growing industry, facilitating Sugar Gamers' evolution from video game enthusiasts to developers, writers, testers, voice and mocap actors, artists, and designers. As a consummate futurist, Keisha recognizes the potential for video games to transcend their role as entertainment and become a mechanism for inspiration and social change. As a true geek of all trades and first wave gaming and esports influencer, Keisha's experience spans from introducing introducing game design slash media literacy to underprivileged youth, such as her partnership with Adidas, and the MBA on tech advocacy activations to consulting Microsoft's Xbox division, as well as Logitech, Google, and Meta on inclusive game strategy. With a specialty in forecasting emerging emerging trends in gaming and technology, Keisha's ability to advise businesses and individuals about potential opportunities for growth and sustainability has helped establish her as a respected voice in the global gaming and tech communities. A two-time TEDx speaker, she infectiously passionate and authentically plugged into the world of video games, AI, VR, and geek culture. Keisha identifies compelling ways for gamers and tech to intersect with any industry and inspires other around them, uh, excuse me, inspires other around the infinite possibilities. And last but not least, we have Aphasia Speaks. Aphasia is a Black, genderqueer, drag artist, and full-time content creator. Aphasia runs the Speak Easy on Twitch, which is a hidden gem where you can come and leave 
all your troubles at the door and have a good time with some great company. A phase of strives to make their community an inclusive and welcoming environment. I thank all three of you for being here. I'm super excited to talk about this because it's someone black, but also someone who's trying to create their own business and understand the gaming industry. I think for me, it's been extremely tough and it's been years of just wading through a lot of things that I don't understand. And I'm sure people out there, whether you are black or not, will find a lot of the content that you provide today um, very important and relevant for whatever they may do in the future. So uh, for me, I just want to start off with a very lighthearted foundational question and just know what was your first experience with gaming that inspired you to pursue a career in this industry? I like how we're being question. polite. Right. <laughs> no, no, just jump in. I'm already uh, like uh, uncomfortable after all these bios. I'm just like, whoa, we've been doing a lot. <laughs> I yeah. nominate aphasia to answer that Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Slay okay. work. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so my earliest memory of any video game I've ever played uh, was... <laughs> Mortal Kombat 2 on the Sega Genesis. Um, I barely knew what I was doing. Uh, I think I was like maybe three or four years old playing it with my dad. I should not have been playing this game at all at that young age. But I remember I picked Raiden and I would beat my dad all the time by just like teleporting and like charging across the, the stage to a point where he got so mad at me, he had to walk away from not like yelling at me as a child. Um, so that's like my earliest memory. So like gaming has been established very early on in my life. I, you know, play everything I possibly get my hands on. You know, I do love me a good RPG. Uh, I love me a cute little shooter, but like not like Call of Duty, not the ugly ones, the cute ones like Apex and Overwatch um, because those are colorful. <laughs> um, but uh, like... At the start of the pandemic was really when I started to like get into streaming um, because I before that I was just like busy working and living my life, you know, the, the go, 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 go of everyday life pre pandemic. And then pandemic hit, I lost both of my jobs because they were like both uh, public facing jobs. And so I was like, well, I have some money saved up and. You know, there's a game coming out on Steam that I wanted to get. Never, never finished the game, even though I, I got, I built my own PC, got the game, and never finished it because I started streaming. And ever since then, in like June, July of 2020, I just like hit the ground r running. I've been streaming. That's when I, was, I started doing drag um, the winter, like December 2019. Um, so I like just started doing drag. I was starting to go out in public and trying to get gigs and of course the pandemic hit once again and so I started doing it online and found a whole community of like-minded people that enjoyed what I did it wasn't until like September October of 2020 where I found other black queer content creators that had the same ideas and the one did the same things that I did and I was like oh work in the subset that I found there's more people that look like me that are doing the damn thing and I could actually have a conversation. And uh, ever since then, it's been like amazing. So. I'll go next. Um, for me, I've been gaming a really long time. Uh, what kind of sparked me to, I guess, want to go in the game industry was uh, 2014, the hashtag that started all, which was I need to burst games. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, a, ooh, I'm so, well, I was mad at the game industry. Let me not tell that lie. Um, but it wasn't like, there was no just greater purpose. It was, I'm just mad about the state of video games. And then as the hashtag kind of grew and became its own thing. And also um, the pushback made me more ornery and more determined to go do the work because I'm full of spite. And I was like, okay, you don't want me here? Fine, I'm going to go do the thing ten times as hard. So now, nine years later, I'm still here and doing things like this. Sometimes all you need is spite. 
Yeah. Oh, all I'm day, every day. That's all you need. <laughs> spite fuels me. You know, it's like it's oh, yeah. like a cup of coffee and then go on Twitter and spite somebody. It's like a great day. Mm. <laughs> I just keep all my rage on the inside so I can have this peaceful face. But uh, I guess my start is in 1989. I was looking over my older brother's shoulder as he was uh, playing Tetris and the music got in my head and I didn't realize then, but like I have this sort of, uh, I started thinking about Tetris after he played it, right? And I did that with like almost every game, thinking about the game afterwards. Um, it wasn't until like on a fluke when Craigslist was really cool, I um, answered an ad to be a uh, tester for Stranglehold at Midway Games in 2005 or 2006. Oh, wow. And I was the only uh, person of my flavor. And um, I had a completely different outlook on how that game was played, the mechanics, and everyone else. And I was like, this is interesting. Um, like just the psychology behind how we all play and how we're different and what are the stories that lead us to games. So um, at the time, I was actually in real estate. And if you guys know anything about the Chicago Spire, that's a juicy pit, a bit of Chicago history. But um, in 2008, in the last recession we had, I, I, everything that I worked for disintegrated. And it didn't matter my education or how hard I worked or how well I had networked in the real estate industry. My career was you know, decimated. So I, I, I tried out for this show called Ultimate Gamer, and uh, it didn't go well for me because I'm not good at games, amongst other things. And so I uh, came back to Chicago and I'm like, I'm going to find some people like myself to play games with women, people of color, just different types of people. We're just going to play games because we like to play games. I didn't really have a, a structure. Um, I wasn't going to be competitive. I just wanted to meet other gamers and have a inclusive community that I didn't see. Uh, and this whole kind of approach was pretty accidental. It was 2008, 2009. So this was before we had any language around uh, some of the identity expressions that we had. So I just really wanted like sort of an inclusive group of people to play games with. And I'm, uh, 14 years later, uh, here, here I am. <laughs> so. All of this sounds amazing, and at least it feels it feels relatable to me because I'm like, it, either it's spite, and I have issues where I'm like, I want to do everything, so stream and create games, and do, I'm like, and I have a full time job, <laughs> so it's very hard to balance all of those. But it's nice to hear the perspectives where there's things that I have I have a lot of spite, and it fuels me to do a lot of stuff. Um, Having older siblings, for example, um, playing games and you just like just looking at them play like, can I do that? And then the phase of you're on Twitch right now doing all of this incredible stuff. And I am literally at this point where I'm like, how do you do it? Like I can see different parts of me from your stories. And I just love that so much. Um, and so hopefully this next question is going to get me over this next hump and other people, too. Um, which is, you've already talked about what your interests uh, were, how you got there, but I'm so curious, like, everybody hit a, everybody will hit a wall eventually. Like, there's this thing where you're like, I have the idea, I know what I need to do, or maybe you didn't know what you needed to do, but hopefully you didn't hear that dog behind me barking outside. Um, but uh, you have this idea that you want, you have the plan, but you hit a wall. So I want to know, like, what was the biggest challenge you've gone through, whether it's the beginning or maybe in the middle, um, what you're going through now, and how did you navigate that? Um, well, for me, <laughs> uh, it's always been a constant state of flux and a constant state of uh, uncertainty. Um, the, the, this industry constantly evolves. And um, how, where I see myself placed in it uh, is, is usually changing. And that has led to a, a lot of anxiety, um, you know, failing at things. I failed at so many things over the years. I mean, I have had some major ails. However, 
whenever I want to give up, it's like the universe sends me some effing kid. Some effing kid that's just like, oh, I didn't know that there were black people that worked in video games. And like this happened just as recent. I mean, it happened way before, but it happened just as recently as 2018, 2019. I had a young person come up to me and like, how did you do it? And I'm just like, man, how did I end up here? <laughs> feeling the the pull of like all right i gotta do it for me because if, if i was that kid i i would want somebody to be out there you know doing what i'm doing now so it's like kind of a full circle like it's the kids man and the parents the parents too they always get me it was like oh my kid really likes video games and we saw you doing things so how can we do it and i'm just like man i don't know what i'm doing but <laughs> <laughs> what gets me through the wall is like I only have two choices and as a gamer you know when you take your L you learn something new you go back you try again the only way you really lose a game is if you stop playing so every time I hit a wall you know I get back up I just keep on going and I just end up being here <laughs> you know so we need to take that and put that in a quote <laughs> yep I need someone, that someone put that on a shirt yeah right. Um, <laughs> uh, I actually did put that on a shirt. I have a shirt that says, "I woke up today full of spite and ambition," Ooh. and that is usually how I keep going. And I know that sounds like super negative to some people, but the more people I hear, okay, I now I hear myself, and I don't know why. Um, sorry, y'all. Was trying to make sure I don't have an echo. Um. I, I'm, I'm either of two modes. One, if someone says I should not go do the thing, I will then go do the thing a hundred times more and be full of spite. I've actually given talks on the power of spite or like he just said, that person that comes up to you is like, I didn't know that there are people like me who do this. Especially, I didn't know that there were black women are in the game industry or, um, you know, in my case, especially with doing tabletop that there are black people, black women, people of color who do tabletop and play this and have fun with it. And I can view them on Twitch or YouTube or what have you. Cause there's so many people who have never seen people like themselves in this industry, or you don't get to see other people like you, unless you can go to something like GDC or dice or these industry events that are lacking in access to anyone who doesn't have a few thousand dollars or doesn't have a company that will pay for them. So it's those moments of seeing someone like you makes me think I can do this, but also just spite. I'm just a spiteful person in general. So I may just add to that really quick. I don't mean to interrupt aphasia because I want to hear how she ke keeps going. Um, <laughs> like it's still shocking to me that this happens. Like when, in 2008, when I first started, I was like, yeah, okay. You know, I, it's it's novel to see women and people of color in the gaming industry, but this will surely change in the next few years. And there has been progress, but it's still shocking some of the challenges that still persist. So like making it all the way like 10 years later to encounter that narrative over and over, it still like blows my mind. I'm still very surprised by it when it happens. And it, again, it recalibrates me right back to like, man, we still here? People still mm -hmm. need to see me in this space? Mm -hmm. <laughs> see Tanya, mm -hmm. see a face, see Robin? Like, it's it's crazy to me. Anyways, I'm sorry. Okay, you should no. Be no, no, you are, go. you are so <laughs> right. Like, that's what I was going to say. Like, for me, like, whenever, like, the, the burnout of constantly streaming and then getting into drag while streaming and things like that, because, like, People don't understand that it takes me at least two hours to get into this, right? And that's two hours I'm doing this before I stream for like six to eight hours at at most recently. But like that's time that people don't see, you know? And so it's like, well, if I get into all of this and no one's at the stream, like, is it worth it? You know? So like I had a wall in 2020 where it was like, I wasn't seeing any growth in my streams and my social media and anything that I was doing. And it kind of just like got me down. It was like full stop. I was, I stopped streaming for like a month 
or it was like maybe one stream a week and it was like for three hours something like that right but then like i'm so lucky and blessed to have like an amazing support system of friends that i have made on here who are like-minded who support me and everything that i do whether it's just like you know lurking in the stream or just like hanging out discord call watching movies playing games just like chilling and hanging out like decompressing and like knowing that that is there for me is so incredibly reassuring I love all my friends um the teams that i'm part of on uh twitch team stream queen tentacolor and overture doing fantastic and amazing things um but like to get me out of that it's like the whole like tentacle like, like with both of you it's like the spite thing where it's like i don't see anyone that is like people sit like i'll play a game and we all know like all multi online multiplayer games are toxic and homophobic racist misogynistic anything you can think of these <laughs> these gamer bros behind their computers will say and type out anything because they, they they feel like they're sick and then i come out of nowhere and start reading them all for filth and it's like no what we're not going to do today is have little johnny over here think that they can get away with saying all these and so that always brings me back out of that funk and to also like see someone like me represented or like i get a message from somebody saying hey how are you doing you know mr streams i just want to check in you know or like randomly every now and then i'll get a message from somebody like hey i saw one of your streams and your makeup inspired me to do this and i really love how I, that turned out and i'm like oh my gosh like people actually noticing who i am. so those things i guess combining the two are just like really what helps me get out of those funks along with the support system that i do have so that's been really um but once again spite is a very powerful motivator mm -hmm. I spite think all hate, do do wonder. <laughs> yeah, hate too. Um, I, I think all of this is absolutely wonderful because I very small streamer. <laughs> I don't have any time to really do things. Um, I have big dreams for you know creating. I'll just put this out there: a, a, a legitimate video game publication that is focused on diversity um, and actually interviewing and, and highlighting developers and, and creators who are queer, who are black, who are Asian, who everybody, but I, I want something like that. And I haven't seen that yet. And I'm, I'm getting bogged down. <laughs> so having, having the opportunity just to hear your stories and understand like, okay, you, you're, you're going to hit a wall, but there is something that's going to take you out of it. It's super helpful for me. Right now I'm running on spite though. Um, maybe something else will replace that. Um, now, since you've all hit that wall, you've gotten over that hump or there's an ebb of flow of it, I would love to know, um, how do you actually get eyes on your business? That is something that I think is one of the most difficult things you can do. And of course there's social media, but, and obviously there's a secret sauce or something that you have that, Either you want to give out or you don't, and that's fine too, however you want to answer this. But um, I would just love to know, like, what efforts have been, like, like the most effective in increasing your brand awareness and uh, uh, visibility to other larger brands or people that you've networked with? Tanya the wine that's got um, a gajillion Twitter followers and maybe <laughs> names and stuff, and hanging out with you. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, though. I may have those Twitter followers, but right now Twitter is broken for everybody, so it oh, doesn't it's make not a difference. Good right now, yeah. Uh, I was told today before I wanted to retweet this and a couple other things. It's like you've hit your daily limit, and I was like, what? I know I can be chatty, but I haven't hit twenty four thousand tweets or twenty four hundred. So Twitter's broken. We couldn't even, I couldn't even promote this right before we went live. Yeah. Uh, but for me, you know, you hit the nail on the head about networking. And for some, for, you know, Twitter and other stuff is, is fine, but um, there is nothing that replaces it to me as being able to go to things like PAX, GDC, um, East Coast Games Conference, those places where you can see people and have face-to-face -face conversations or mass-to-mass -mass conversations as it should be now. And having a chance to, to have an in-person interaction because there's so much 
that you can convey sitting with someone or across the table or e that you can't even do even on a video call because you can only see this much of us that my body language, other stuff, or the excitement about a project or something can't really convey in a video call or in definitely not in text or on social media because when it does work, we only get so many characters. Um, but it's also making legitimate connections, not just I'm going to come to you because you can do something for me. It may start as a business transaction, it may be transactional, but if you don't interact with other people as real live human beings, it's going to end real quick. Or people, or you say, this is a transaction, we've done our one thing, we're good, but that's not how you grow and how you meet other people. And I'm sure, Aphasia, you know this from streaming, is the transactional network, nature of some people where they talk to you only when they want something exactly. or they come around only when you're on the come up, you announce something real dope you're doing. And suddenly all these people are your friends. They're in your DMS. They're tweeting at you. So treating other people like people and being genuine, even if a business transaction never occurs, someone's going to remember how you talked to them, how you treated them well after that business is concluded. So it's being a real live human being and getting, having the, opportunity and the privilege to travel because travel still costs a lot and it costs more now than it did pre-pandemic so there's also that as well basically having money and having money came basically after almost nine years of hard work and it's still not like excess money um <laughs> oh I, I, I was go ahead i'm sorry i was just gonna say uh, i suck at networking go ahead <laughs> oh yeah I, I got you i got you we'll talk um i've learned like like Tanya was saying, like the transactional nature of people online when you can't like meet them face to face. Cause like I, most of my business, my business is my shit, right? So like I'll do like collab streams with people or I'll try and find, you know, a partnership with a company or um, go out and try to get like uh, a game code to promote this game so this dev company can like look at me and say oh let's work with them more and partner with them just like it's all about like trying to make those connections and partnerships um but what's really helped me out is doing um the shout casting that i've done for the tournaments that i've hosted um so i've done four three or four apex tournaments uh all queer ran poc owned and operated uh tournaments that i've been a part of and then we're doing another one on saturday for valorant um getting my name my brand out there that way also doing things like the stream queens con which is the all drag queer con that we put on on twitch for the past two years i've been a part of that it's been a huge thing um twitch has been like yeah no we're gonna keep doing this because this has been amazing for everybody um and so getting my name out there like that and actually finally getting a chance to go to twitchcon last year and meeting people face to face was absolutely amazing i had a fantastic time barely remember the weekend but just enough to remember the people <laughs> um and it is so important because like all the people i've known online for like two and a half years and finally I'm like oh my gosh you have legs like this is wild to see you walk around and at that point I was like we're really solidifying the connections that I have and I can really see who you are and see what you're about um, because way back last year when the team Overture that I started and founded with a couple of friends started someone had said well what does Overture even do and at that point we were just like maybe like a month old but we had already put on tournaments beforehand, not underneath the Overture name because we had we just rebranded. And now they're one of my friend's DMs talking about the team. And I'm like, oh, that's very interesting that now you want to come around with all that. Okay, cool. I see who you are. Perfect. So, you know, just making the real connections, talking to people and really seeing for who they are, like, see through all the bs that people try to like weave around and try to like you know suck in with their with their like sweet honeyed words like no no no, no. i know who i know what you're about i know what you actually want so watch out for the snake <laughs> um 
So like I, one of the things that I think sometimes uh, people might misconstrue about like my, uh, what I do in gaming is that I'm not a content creator or really an influencer. Uh, what, what I do and, and how I've done it, like to get eyes on it, uh, you have to remember, like I started in 2008. So, uh, and I started at the end of my, you know, sort of career in real estate. So I was still doing uh, that, but like I, I made some major investments uh, like um, uh, uh, Tanya and Aphasia mentioned, uh, traveling to these conferences um, are exceptionally expensive. But I had someone sort of teach me how to be a media company and get a pass to E3. And uh, like I could go, but I would have to like get my ticket and my hotel and plan this whole thing. And this was back in 2010. And um, meeting people in that time was just so much different and the connections that you made were so solid, right? And before internet and Paris, not internet, but social media and streaming and content creating really just took off, um, parasocial relationships weren't that thing. Mm -hmm. You might play online, but at some point you were going to meet those online friends and it was going to be like, you know, a bond, a loyalty. You know, there, there was something very human about it. I, I find the, the relationships and like getting eyes on things has this very strange effect that's not really very uh, complete for me. So it doesn't come full circle. Um, I find online relationships, they're great, but people tend to treat them very disposable, like, like they're disposable. Um, and I'm introverted and sensitive. So people treating the time and the passion and the effort that I get to know them as something that's disposable feels a little weird. So I air probably, this is probably an antiquated approach, uh, but I, I definitely strive to meet people in person, which means that I, I meet less people, I have less eyes, but the eyes that I do have are much more engaged mm -hmm. because they know me, they, they can see I'm a real person, and I feel like I can express my authenticity for what I do here in a way that might not always come through in uh, strictly online virtual spaces. So I err very much on like, let me go meet this person. Let me go be there. Let me save up the money to make the investment to be where it's happening and, and meet these people that I think are important, that I want to be either a part of their community or a supporter of what they're doing or ask them to support what I'm doing. Uh, that approach is, like I said, most likely antiquated and it is expensive. And I'm so glad that these uh, platforms have allowed us to connect in ways where we can bypass some of those, uh, you know, um, financial or, you know, uh, just it's more accessible. Right. Uh, but I still find like this, like being there in the same room with the person talking just makes a world of difference. Um, and it, it, and it connects the relationship so much more. So the things that I just heard for the people out there listening, uh, be careful of snakes. Uh, be careful of parasocial relationships. <laughs> You're not getting out of networking, so you got to do it. <laughs> I heard that. That's the number one thing that's ringing in my head. Um, and quality over quantity in terms of the, the relationships that you build, which is all incredible advice and things where I'm just like, ah. Oh, it's so hard for me to do. Um, of course, the parasocial relationships and the snake stuff, I have yet to deal with that. But I'm also not, I mean, I'm a nice person. But when I come across stuff like that, I just literally shut that down. So um, well, I got a quick thing just, you know, before we move on. Yeah, yeah. And this sounds weird because we're not, we can't see the audience. But uh, just in chat, do people understand what we mean when we say parasocial relationships? Because I, so. I feel like some people know what it is. Some people may think it's one thing. Um, but a quick definition is that, you know, like, let's say all of us, like, we didn't know each other. Most of us have interacted in one way before this panel, one way or another. 
let's say I only ever talk to aphasia when I see that aphasia is on the come up or I'm always there. I'm always like, oh, you're my bestie. And I'm always like doing things like here's some subs. Here's a gift. Here's whatever. And I think that means that aphasia owes me all their time. Owes me all their extra time. There's a there's a one sidedness of the person who is invested that way thinks that they have a deeper relationship with the content creator, celebrity, whoever it is that is that has the bigger profile. They think there's way more of an investment. It's not a two way street; it's a one way street. And that's the way I try to explain what we do: be it content creation, be it you know journalism, be it you know, being a media company and entity, th the person you know online or that you meet at a con that you've never met or you've only interacted with, there's still a wall there. And it's not a bad thing, but you need to understand sometimes the ways in which we interact with people is either transactional or one-sided or not as deep as some people want to make it. I just got to say, um, parasocial relationships have always been weird to me. Um, it is the strangest thing to attach yourself and make yourself believe that you're a friend of someone that you don't really know. You know of the things that they do. <laughs> you don't know them. Um, so uh, the world I, is weird. It, it is. And I, I've, I'm blessed because I am small that I have not come across any of that. But uh, there I'm going to stop you. Stop saying you're small. Say you're a creator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're moderating well, thank right you now. Yeah, thank you do your thing um thank you i want to add one more thing you know uh we're entering okay we're gamers right mm -hmm. and we're we a lot of us were attracted to games uh before it became our career for some probably a mental health benefit of sorts whether it yes. was uh escapism, whether it was competition, whether it was like just connecting, we all had a reason to want to escape, you know, mainstream life and immerse ourselves in a character or world or whatever. Uh, so like, I think that as gamers, you know, we are also, it's easy for us to probably understand that we're now living in a world, especially over the last 10 years, where people are having a harder time connecting in person. So, you know, with loneliness rising, with people feeling othered and people feeling not seeing themselves represented and having more and more anxiety about what it means to interact with a fellow human being and, you know, the fear of some sort of rejection or the fear of some sort of negative um uh, you know, response happening. Yeah, you know, I, I do get parasocial relationships. They're safer. They're much more safe. You know, it's like you get somebody some money, you get somebody some attention online, and it feels good when they're like, thank you. And they really genuinely appreciate it. But it's not the whole thing. It's not the whole relationship. And I think like since the pandemic, all of us have been in this world a little bit trying to figure out how to have meaningful, purposeful human lives while kind of being stuck in, or, you know, like interacting with people so much on a screen. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Like I, I'm sensitive to people who build parasocial relationships because I know that there's a reason why they're doing it and gaming uh, specifically attracts, I feel even more of that than usual. Um, because there's so many more ways to connect. And so I just try to like, you know, just be open to, you know, human, you know, while making sure that I have my own boundaries, but being open to like why people might want to build that kind of relationship with me or, you know, what challenges or, or things that might be in place. So, and, and those things are, are enriching to me too, you know? So it's like, I want to, Parasocial relationships do get scary and weird and uncomfortable sometimes, but there's also some positive benefits in that you'll be able to meet people that you would never be exposed to due to location or whatnot. So, you know, I think it's like, it's- A balance. It's, yeah, you got to balance out how you look at it because if it weren't for parasocial relationships, I probably wouldn't be this far along in my career. 
But if it weren't for parasocial relationships, maybe I would be an influencer or a content creator or a streamer, but I can't. I'm just like, that's too much. It's too much stimulation right there. So I can only do so much. But anyways, I just wanted to put that out there. No, no, no. That's totally fine. Um, I mean, I look, I follow a lot of people who are streamers. And every now and then I've, when I'm talking to them, I'm like, I feel like I know you. I don't go too far. <laughs> Because I, I like to mind my business as I hope they mind theirs. But I it, I totally get it. I mean, that's part of the reason why I created my own uh, streaming channel. Because I'm like, I, first of all, I could do this. Like, y'all not that good at games. Like, I could do this too. But also, it's just like, I the, I work from home. So it, now it's even more isolating for me where I'm like, I don't see people. This is weird to me. So that is part of the, the community aspect of everything. Um, now, so I'm so curious, like, I don't know, how do you find startup funds or how are you finding these partnerships? Sure. Networking and getting yourself out there and building the community to show those people that you are who you are. Give me the money. But from the standpoint of somebody who doesn't know, like, how do you even navigate this? this world of startup funds and partnerships and things of that nature uh i can start from like my streaming aspect it's word of mouth really i know like recently like <laughs> the term nepo baby hasn't thrown around a lot but sometimes and i've said this before sometimes being a nepo baby is not bad because it can help you I out it's like if you make a connection with somebody, like a genuine connection with somebody, and they enjoy what you do, and you enjoy your like their their company, and they enjoy yours. Like, hey, I had this. Uh, I have a friend who has opportunity. I think you'd be great for. Would you be interested in doing it or this, that, and the other, or whatever? And for me, that's helped out a lot because I, I'm whatever you meet me. However, I am here. It's how I'm in person. Every single person I've met. The in person that I met online, I was like, "Wow, you're the exact same." I'm like, "Yeah, why would I need to like all?" All I say is like, "Aphasia is just an extension of who I am as outside of all this makeup, but just a little louder." You know, like I'm already outgoing, I'm already extroverted, I'm already want to make friends with everyone. Like I'm, I'm a Leo. Like I'm, I love people. You know, and for me, it's like going to like people's chats and like making friends with them and then eventually playing games with them having those like, actual relationships and then like meeting some of them face to face and it's like wow you're actually a pretty dope person i'm like yeah i know duh cool. that's very leo behavior by the way thank you thank you <laughs> i like i i know and i'm very proud of it and that's also leo behavior but that's beside the point <laughs> um uh and it's just like having those friends that are like hey this thing's coming up do you want to do it and I was like, of course I want to do it. Like, yeah. Like, I get to meet all these people. Like, have these other contacts. And then, in turn, those people that I've worked with on that project are like, oh, have something else. And this person has something. And, like, it just branches out like that. And, like, for me personally, in the streaming, the streaming space, uh, I feel like I've navigated it pretty well. Um, I know some people who are kind of, like, struggling because, like, they turn down something just because, like, it, e even if it's paid or not, like, if if I am genuinely interested about it and something that I care about, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I'll make time. I'll figure it out. And some people only want to do opportunities like, oh, it's not paid. I don't want to do it. Oh, I'm not going to get this. I'm not going to do it. I was like, no, you, like, I take every opportunity that you can actually identify with and do it. Don't like at, in the beginning. You really can't be extremely. You you can you can be picky, but you can't just say, "Oh, I'm not gonna do that because it doesn't pay me this amount of money, or it's only this and this person." But whatever, right? Like I'm at the point where it's like, I'm okay doing whatever I need to do, and like my community helps me out if I like if something breaks on my stream or like a piece of equipment breaks. I'm like, all right, stream. I'm going to do something stupid. Let's do something stupid for subs or for tips because if I can't get this fixed, I won't be here. And the stream was like, well, we want you around, so do something dumb. Like, drink hot sauce shots, which was a terrible idea. 
don't do <laughs> it. <laughs> and I hate hot sauce. So I was like, not doing that again. But I probably will because the stream seemed to enjoy it. So like, you know, I mean, I'm here to make a fool of myself and also be center of attention because, you know, whatever. You don't have to worry about me because I will not be drinking hot sauce. That's just <laughs> not happening. Though I love some hot sauce, I'm just not going to be drinking it straight up. Um, I do not drink <laughs> I do not recommend that. <laughs> I drink hot shots. I have drank hot sauce shots, not even for entertainment, but that's how much I like hot sauce. So oh, I guess no. I'll be the weird one here. <laughs> oh, no. Go with God and anime is one of my friends says. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you do that alone. Um, and, and, some fried fish. Some chicken, like you got something, but not by itself. Pickle juice, just, just okay. That's different. See, I also hate pickles. I hate pickles. Yes, I hate pickles. Okay, now I'm actually doing a subathon of the month uh, to help me get to New York for the gaming awards, and uh, the the last one for 200 subs is eat a pickle because my community knows how much I hate pickles. Like they gag me. I'm just like. And so I was like, eat a whole pickle on stream. I can't spit it out. I have to eat the whole thing. And I'm... Oh, pickles are delicious. And I don't know if that's a Chicago thing, but like, just get the little pack. First of all, it was like the very... I needed a dill or a kosher, a kosher dill pickle with a nice snap to it. I just eat them by themselves. It's just great. So what? Aphasia, I'll eat it much? for you. <laughs> so, Aphasia, how much to just like get you to the Game Awards and not have you torture yourself? <laughs> Because I, well, I don't know. Because be I fun. hate. I'm just gonna be that person. <laughs> and also, I don't know how you find money. We still have a Patreon. That's where I need diverse games. Is y'all got mm. money? I'll take it. Because that look. But also, as someone who streams, I will never do something that I hate for other people's entertainment. So please let us know how we can get you there <laughs> without you drinking or eating a pickle because you hate them. I'll let you. I mean, me or I don't know, this little thing called I Need Diverse Games could help. I don't know. Oh. Yes. I'll pin you up then. <laughs> Making a connection because I I don't know how you do it. You're never going to see me do something crazy like that. I can't do it. Terribly. And with Mm-mm. horrible faces that have no, been screen capped no. many times. <laughs> no, no, no. We're, we're, we're going to work this out. No. Well, that is not how you game, For your <laughs> Oh my gosh. Y'all, y'all chat. I'm, and I'm about to turn into a streamer right now. Chat, we need to save aphasia from themselves. <laughs> doing this pickle challenge. Please yeah. on twitter.com, coffee.com slash aphasia speaks. Please save aphasia from themselves in this fate of pickles. If I don't have to eat a pickle, even please. And I will see please. you in New York. You can go ahead and send those pickles my way. I will eat them. Oh, yeah. Um, eat them all the <laughs> We'll save you. I know we're talking, we're supposed to be talking about funding, but like, I, <laughs> trust me, I will, I will, I will eat it for you. I love, love, and I'll throw some hot sauce on it too, but that's a you whole know, you, that, you, That's all you, boo boo. I will watch it. I'll be good, good for you. <laughs> but Keisha, Keisha is the one who knows this answer. Yeah, I, I, still I can't have wait. Not unlock this. Uh, so, I, the answer I'm gonna give you, no one's gonna like it. So all you guys out in chat, all you human, lovely humans, you're not gonna like this. Um, so I had a whole career before I started Sugar Gamers, and um, I bootstrap. I still bootstrap, mm. and I am fortunate enough to do so uh, in some ways. In some ways, it was a lot of sacrifice. Like I don't have children. I don't have a lot of assets besides Sugar Gamers. I constantly invest money back into the things that I want to do. Now that's difficult. I, I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat that in any way, but that's how passionate I am about the space. That's how much I love video games that the beginning of my career in this space, I was spending all my own money um, that I got from another job, which was real estate. Uh, so that's number one. <laughs> like. Uh, to, you know, I still haven't really figured out a way to get investment without making investments in yourself first. So if you're, you know, uh, re- whether you're a video game, 
you specialize in something like, you know, content creation or something technical or narrative or whatever, or whether you're a generalist, you're going to have to invest in what it is that you want to be known for, right? Like if you're going to make some element of a game, you have to put that in your portfolio. Like you're not going to just come straight like, oh, I want to work in games now. And, you know, especially on, on this chat, we have to make some differences here between like what it means when we're hitting a wall because of the isms and the phobias uh, or when we're hitting a wall because we didn't put in the work. And both exist and both are challenging, you know what I'm saying, uh, to put in the work and also have other work to finance the work. And then you have to deal with homophobia and racism and sexism and all the other things. But this is one of the most competitive industries that there is. I'm so lucky to be here. Uh, so on the one hand, like, yeah, we got to still fight. We got to still fight to represent what it means to be a person with our lived experiences to be in the video game industry. It's very important that we do that. But also we have to acknowledge it's very competitive, very competitive. So you can't just half do this and you can't go in too optimistic. Like there, you know, I, I worked a lot of years in a space for free or paying my own way from something else. Um, and it wasn't until maybe five years ago, I was able to consistently be able to work in the industry, uh, I guess, properly. Um, I've tried investment. That is a completely different game. That's a departure from what it is that we're talking about right now. Uh, how you raise money and have those decks and get a, a investor, venture capitalist, it's a completely different thing that you have to study, understand, and then on top of that, it is majorly combined with networking. It's who you know and how they know you and what they're expecting to extract from your work. It's not, it's something that we have to be very sober about because we look at uh, the public discourse and the media and we see all these things. It's like, oh, this company got a million dollars. This company got $15 million. A lot of individuals don't know that that's not a lot of money in the video game industry. That's not a lot of money when you have a huge team and you're, you're making something that is, is, you know, artistically or technically um, sophisticated. So like, yeah, it sounds like a lot. It's not. Uh, and it goes quick. And a lot of people fail. Um, I think that looking for investment in some ways is probably should be kind of one of the last options after you have bootstrapped and invested in yourself to the best of your ability that you're networked and you really know where it is that you want to go. Having some focus and like having clarity in what it is that you're offering, what your services are, what you specialize in or generalize in is uh, super important. You know, a lot of us like games from our heart, but from a, in a business standpoint, a lot of us can't articulate clearly what it is that we do. Uh, it took me years and years, and yet I, I, I'm just now figuring it out now. Um, and it's 14 years later. So there's no shortcuts. There's gotta be a, a lot of dedication. And I would say that in this space, especially with people getting into content creation and, uh, you know, being um, streamers, like sometimes we see just too much of what appears to be an overnight success from mm -hmm. a person just being, you know, this person. And you don't know what they have. You don't know, like, as to, as to what Aphasia had mentioned earlier, you don't know what kind of support system that they have. You don't know what kind of money that they, were, they had to be able to invest in themselves. You don't know how long they might have been working at this and building it and planning for it. Um, and a lot of times we compare where we're at to these very one-dimensional narratives as to why and how somebody came, became successful. Like, are your morals and values in alignment with how that person became successful? And a lot of us do all this comparative analysis thinking that we're not doing great because we're comparing ourselves to someone whose pathway would be completely closed off to us if we tried to do it the same way. So that's the, the other thing. Be very clear about why you're here uh, because there are going to come times where your passion is going to have to pay you. You know what I'm saying? Like your love for the games, 
your love for this space, your love for this community has to be what gets you uh, ahead. That, that's that been my narrative. I mean, and I've had some, again, a lot of L's, but I've also had some wins for sure. Uh, but it's, it's not as, as cut and dry and you got to see like what part of the industry you want to be in. If you want to try to get into like some blockchain and some crypto and some, uh, uh, you know, um, some esports and and that sort of thing, you know, there's a lot of blueprints out there for some of that. But you know, that's a a, a different way of looking at games entirely. Uh, so you know, I don't know. It's just a lot to think about. But it's a departure from the fun space that sometimes we see when we see like successful streamers. When the video game sort of ecosystem, you know, streaming is just one slice of that pie in which what makes up what video games is as an industry and what part people want to play or see the opportunities for themselves and how they want to extract, you know, that as a career or get financing and so on and so forth. You have to have a clear narrative, a clear goal and have had invested in yourself so investors know why they're investing in you as well. So... Hopefully that helps, but like, yeah, no, it's that's hard, hard, hard. And, <laughs> uh, and, uh, hard I actually, can I add something? Cause I'm not sure how we, how good we are on time, but I want to add something in Go for it. To, to follow up what Keisha said, because what I realized a lot of people see quote unquote influencers and they see like, they also call anybody who does like streaming, what have you, they call that whole category influencers. And what I've run into is that people have a view of influencers they just give free stuff or they just are getting like free games they're getting paid all this money or like if you're a twitch partner or youtube partner or whatever you're getting all this money and it's this weird idea that once you get a check mark on social media you get a check mark on twitch or instagram or what have you then money's just flowing in and your life is just all beaches and fun and free stuff. Let me tell you, that is the absolute not truth of that. Because for every free product, I may have to do a video, a tweet, send these people analytics. If people don't show up to a sponsored stream or interact with a sponsor post, okay, cool, I've got this thing. But if I don't, if I don't have a benefit to them to keep sending me the quote unquote free stuff that people think is the benefit of being an uh, influencer or a streamer, or what have you, they're not going to keep sending me that stuff. So it is a constant hustle. Um, streaming, content creation, and not just being live. F anyone who's ever tried to edit a video knows for every 10 minutes of video that someone gets, there's probably hours of editing behind it. Also, if you are mindful and try to add closed captions, that is hours and hours of work. Even if you let a service do the work and you got to go back in and fix it, you're looking at for maybe a three hour like TTRPG stream, for instance, or even just say an hour and a half. That is hours of cutting down on the audio side, cutting down ums, ahs, noise, what have you. So for all of this work, all this free stuff that people think we're getting or all of the kudos or all this money they think we're making, trust me, we've all put in hours and hours and hours of unpaid labor to get to that point. Because I'm, I'm now in year nine and I'm finally at a point where I feel fiscally comfortable and can kind of be picky and choosy. It wasn't always like that. And, you know, like Aphasia said, you you will do stuff where it's like, this is a dope project. I'm not in it just to get paid X amount of money because I, too, have met the people with an F you pay me mentality of if it's not paid, I ain't doing it. But then when you look at their metrics and their numbers and just their personality, it's like, you have the nerve to be asking for this kind of money when this is what you do. Like I've seen your streams. I've seen your content. And you out here demanding 500, 600 an hour for a sponsor stream, but you have, frankly, not the F you pay me product at the end of the day to request that. Because I'm trying to be keep it clean uh, since we are, we are on, you know, professional network space. Um, but I think people need to realize, or just because you haven't heard of someone, because I'm sure we've all got that, well, I haven't heard of this person. Who are they if we get an interview, an article, what have you? It's like, I can't help it because you don't go outside. <laughs> Look, I, it's the end of the day. I have, I mean, like, a fa like aphasia and Keisha, 
this is who you get if you get to meet me in person. I'm the same person. I'm still spiteful and salty IRL as I am on screen. I love that. I love that. Oh, you know, I got to say something real quick, you know, <laughs> just while I'm here, because I don't get to see Tanya all the time. Like what she does, I just am in awe of it because I could, I can't. Like the 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 constant conversation she's able to have, you're you've been able to have the the way you've been able to be present online, and you know just like be yourself and be like, no, yes, this is where I'm at. This is how I feel. Like I have had, I just I put respect on her name. Like I'd be like, oh, it's me? okay. <laughs> you gonna get what you gonna mm-hmm. get like i'm i'm just like i don't like as soon as somebody disagrees with me i just turn the whole computer off i'm just like i can't <laughs> no. like, like no. i'm gonna I'm just do anything else so i like tanya has i've seen her educate an audience on things and i'm just like wow and and she does so in a way that's like super articulate and thoughtful and sensitive my point in saying it is it takes there is this online thing that people are able to do and some people are are great at it but i don't i want to express to like while we're here that you know it, it's important to look at the full circle i'm glad that you brought that up tanya it's like you don't know who people are but sometimes people who are in this space aren't streamers or content Mm -hmm. creators. And what does that mean? Do people who aren't making their full-time job, you know, being online, because like Tanya said, the editing, the the networking, the, you know, being accessible in this format is a lot of work. It is exceptionally difficult. So like, Mm -hmm. I, you know, sometimes I'm just always very grateful to like be in the presence of, you know, people who do this kind of work, because I do other kind of work, you know, and I'm not streaming. And I'm just like, man, when I show up, people are like, not going to know who I am. They're going to be like, why is she here? She only has a couple of followers on Twitter. (laughs) Like, at the same time, like, since you are out there, you know, you said boots to the ground doing things. It's like things that I'm currently not able to do. And like, I really appreciate that you're like out there with the people saying, hey, look what I'm doing. Look at me because I'm making space for myself, people who look like me. And I'm just like, that is just like fantastic, beautiful, and like so, so incredibly bad. So. Panel love, panel love. <laughs> Um, so I only have one question left. I hope you all are okay with me asking it. Uh, Before I do, I want to just emphasize people, please bootstrap. Um, now you said it was a a sobering thing. I just want to say, uh, that's what I needed to hear. (laughs) I needed to hear that. I'm like, oh, there must be a secret way. No, you need to do the work. You need to do the work. So now I know. Um, and then also... (laughs) Yeah, I I needed to hear it. And then Tanya, you saying, look, there are so many things that you don't understand. And that free thing isn't really free. Don't be fooled. (laughs) It's so important. Fortunately for me, the job that I had before moving into a new full time job, I was getting free stuff anyway. And I'm like, I have to write about this. This isn't free. I got to put hours into reviewing and talking about this. And so fortunately, the day that that type of thing happens to me, it's like, Whatever. I see I have to do the work for it. So, okay. Last question really quickly, and then we'll head on out. What actionable advice would you give to other Black creators, entrepreneurs, and streamers who want to build visibility in the gaming industry? Ooh, can I go first? Yes. And be salty? Yes. Um, Because I'm actually doing a panel on this at PAX East, and it will be streams if you're not going to be at PAX East. No big deal. And I see this especially in our community. Stop with the crab in a barrel mentality. Your success mm-hmm. from someone else's success does not take away from yours. Because, you know, perfect example, Twitch's Black History Month um, announcement, blog post. Every time they, when they highlight anybody, and I saw this literally in the comments. I've been on this platform X number of years and they never asked me nothing. And it's like, Bro, have you 
Use the form that they give you in your creator dashboard. Have you expressed any interest to anybody at Twitch? And why instead of being glad that three these three folks, because um, I, I can't remember everybody's pronouns that were in the video for this year, instead of being glad that these three people are highlighted and promoted and all the people that are getting our front page slot or on the carousel or just on the shelf for Black History Month, you're sitting here being a crab in a barrel because you wasn't in the video. What do you do? What? Why should Twitch notice you? What is it you're doing that's so special? And anytime Twitch promotes anybody black, I see the same dude in the comments every single time. And it's like the energy you're putting forth into these novels of reply to Twitch, you could have filled out the interest form and they would know that you want to do stuff like this. Um, and also... Don't use people. Don't be snakes in the grass because it will come out. And as much as you like to say, oh, black streamer, Twitter or whatever, the world of streaming is smaller than you think. And people talk. They will find out if you are trash. Lift up other people and know when an opportunity ain't for you. And when you can't do something or if you get offered something that's not for you, think of somebody else. Bring them along. Because at the end of the day, your, you may get that 15 seconds of fame and, you know, it may help you come up, but you need to bring other people with you. Mm -hmm. I've real. spread my salt. Is, <laughs> so I, you, you said but, like hit the nail on the head, like to, to put someone else down because you're like, oh, well that, that should be me up there. I'm like, well, what have you done? Like, what have you done for anybody? What have lately? you done? Like, when, whenever, whenever you're sitting here saying, oh, I can do what they do, like, well, but you're not. Like, you're not out there being a part of the community. You have your own small bubble that you want to stay, and you, you expect people to go find you? No. Let's be completely real and honest. The, the tags on Twitch, the, the, no, the, the discoverability on Twitch is horrendous. Okay. Half of the people that I have started, that I've, I follow, I found through a friend, I found through being rated into that person and the ratings to another person. Just like you, it's, you have to make your own way out by being, first, of, first and foremost, your authentic self in you, right? Just be you the whole entire time. Like, I know that I'm not the best at games, but I know that I can talk a whole lot of mess while playing them. And that's why people will enjoy me. Like, I will curse I will curse someone out in a game, even though I lost. It's like it, the game—the game is broken. My my mouse was dead. Uh, I had lag, like with everything else, but me. When everyone knows, it's clearly me. But like, I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, girl. Okay. <laughs> um, but also like, be engaging with other communities. Reach out, like, talk. Like, I'm I'm a serial lurker in chats, but I also know. Like when I am in someone's chat, something funny happens. I say something, or like I come and say, "Hey, what's going on? What's tea?" You know, talk for a couple of minutes and then lurk. Like exclamation point, lurk. Like I'm out for a bit, but I'll be around. Um, just like make yourself willing to do things. Like just I don't know. Stop pigeonholing yourself in a box. Mm -hmm. You know. Like, yes, you are a unique person. Like, yes, I am a black queer drag artist on Twitch. Very, very unique, specific niche, right? But then I have friends who are in other demographics that still, like, intersect with mine. So I, I reach out to, you know, different communities and things that I, I thought I would never do. Or, like, games I would never play or people I would ever talk to. And these people are some, like, the close people. Uh, as friends are like online and met some like most of them in person so it's like just be you be willing to try new things and stay, stay out of your own way like mm. stop self-sabotaging amen to That's that <laughs> like seriously like be you don't get in your own way be open you know, uh, my take on it is, like, 
our community cannot afford to continue having this conversation. Um, over the last seven years, I've been seeing so much with deep fakes, um, digital influencers, AI, uh, you know, and things that can appear to represent the lived experiences of uh, different types of individuals. Um, you know, and like when we, we, you may or may not have seen these things happen. They use like video game tools, video game technology. So we should have, you know, seen some of these things occur. Uh, we have to figure out where we're going to be next. We're, we're living in some interesting times and now is not the time to ignore what's happening in the world or what's happening in this space and where you want to be in the next few years. So I, I just strongly recommend, again, leaning into your unique, uh, your unique and individual self and figuring out what, where you want to be because the, the time it takes being anxious, comparing yourself with others or competing with people that you shouldn't be competing with or copying people, you know, so you can imitate their success we now have to compete with like AI, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm probably sounding crazy right now, but I, I just implore people to, to find their own way and really get focused on what they are trying to extract from being a part of the video game industry. Whatever that is, I uh, just, you know, be really clear on what route you're going to take to get there, because I feel like we're moving and we're transitioning into a different way that we're going to be consuming media, the games that we're going to play, and overall what's going to bring us like meaning and purpose. Uh, and while we're doing this, and and protecting our mental health, and representing you know our communities, and making sure we're authentic in the expression of our uh, you know I, our identities. Um, getting out of our way, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, curbing the time you spend on drama. Because are you here for drama or are you here because of video games? You know, mm -hmm. are you here because you're passionate about this space? Um, because if you want drama, if you want all that sort of thing, you can find that in any industry. And you can, you know, kind of remove yourself. So there's not so much noise. Um, but and not that I, I, I mean it that way. I probably said that uh, crudely. But I, I just no, want you, you, you said it perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I really implore people to lean into what being an original, unique individual is in gaming and uh, finding your own path and not being afraid to explore new ones. Um, yes, you know, we're all here and we all had our own individual journeys to get here. And I wish I could give somebody that blueprint, but no one's going to be able to exactly do exactly what we did. All of us had some unique thing that pushed us along in addition to a passion for this space. So, um, again, with uh, everything that Aphasia and uh, Tanya said about like focusing you know, making sure you know why you're here. Don't like it's our community, right? So like we don't need to be fighting with each other over things that don't progress our narrative. How long are we going to be talking about some of the same issues, uh, whether within our community or without? You know, I'm I'm really after you know more than a decade of this. I'm really looking forward to what the future holds for a new. Uh, conversation to be had about where we're at in this space. Awesome. Well, with that, we hope you all learned from our incredible guests about their experiences in the gaming industry. While building a brand is difficult, it can be done with some time, talent, and ingenuity. So if you want to start your own business, be smart about it and get yourself out there. This is Open World Dialogue. I'm Robin, signing off. Bye and happy gaming. Happy Black History Month.